course of many weeks, we've been studying what, was, what would make a healthy church, a healthy church. And uh, I'm going to look at the very last verse. Now, this whole chapter, chapter 15, this whole thing is about this parable, the parable it's called the parable of the prodigal son. I guess maybe because it deals with humans rather than sheep and coins. I, I suppose if they, you were going to preach this to sheep, you would call it the parable of the sheep. And if you were talking to financial people, you would probably, and I have, I called it the parable of the silver coin. But we're calling this the parable of the prodigal son uh, in verse 32, the father, the son has come home from being a prodigal out in the world and living like the world and got sick and tired of being sick and tired and made a wonderful choice in verse 17. Made a wonderful choice in verse 17. He came to his senses. And he had this inner dialogue about his condition and his choices. If you read on in there, he, he has this inner dialogue. And out of that inner dialogue, he came to realize how important God was in his life and how he abandoned that relationship to be a prodigal, to be a son of the world for a while rather than the son of God. He's got sick of that life. He's missed the relationship with God more than what he found in the world. He lost more than he found. And so that's a key idea in the parable of the prodigal son. It's about what he lost and found. It's interesting that they work on both ends. What he lost and found about the world and what he lost and found about his relationship with God. It's a wonderful story about it. So when he came home and the father had this great celebration in the parable and all of the father's staff and employees had a great celebration, like a 4th of July, everybody was off that day and they, everybody was celebrating the return of the prodigal who was lost and had been found who was dead and now alive. And of course, he wasn't literally dead, so we're talking about the spiritual journey. And he was never lost. But you see, he didn't know he was lost until he couldn't find even himself in the world anymore. And when he became aware that he was lost, that he had lost himself, and was in a pig pen living like a pig. That he was losing a sense of his humanity. He realized he was lost. And he realized he was dead. He was numb. He was dead and numb. I don't know if you've been there. I don't know if you've known people that have been there or are there, but it's a bad place to be. It's a bad place to be. Nobody rescued him. This is the wonderful part of this story. Nobody rescued him. He was able to rescue himself because he had previously had a wonderful relationship with God. And he remembered that relationship, and that's what made his sense of loss so great. And so he has come home. He has come home to the Father. He's willing to live under his rules and regulations, and God didn't require any of them. Isn't that wonderful? Because you see, a relationship with God is all about grace and not works. 
the sooner you learn that, the better off you will be. See, the prodigal left because he thought it was all about works and not about grace. When he came home, he knew it was all about grace and not about works. For when he came home, the worst he imagined wasn't even near. But when he came home, the father embraced him, put the royal robe on him, put the royal ring on him, and put the royal rebox on him just to keep ours. How God treated him was so far beyond what he imagined he, he could treat himself. But he had a brother who had stayed home and didn't run away that didn't like all this celebration. He thought this, the, prodigal, the prodigal son who stayed home thought that the father was rewarding the younger son for sin. And he told his father so. You mean if I'd have went off and lived like a prodigal, you would, sh you would show this great celebration to me? I think it's wrong to reward the sin. He's been out living in the depths of sin. He comes home, we throw him a great party. It looks to me like you're celebrating sin. You know, there are a lot of people who think that. Father didn't think that. Here's what he said. Verse 32. We, we, that's the father, that's the one son who stayed at home and all of his employees. Everybody under the authority of the father is the we. When the son thought about going home, he was willing to go home not as a son but as a servant for the servants of his father were treated better than anybody he'd met in the world. I love the way the father addressed the son. He didn't personally single him out of the herd. He included him in the celebration. I want you to think about that now. And here's what the father said. We had to be merry and rejoice because this brother of yours did you get that? This brother of yours was dead spiritually and has begun to live spiritually. Begun. Did you love that word? Begun. And where did that begin? When he came to his senses and said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired of the world. I need God in my life. I need God. And that whole journey back is fulfilling that need for God. I don't know how you came here today. But I'm going to tell you what. I'm going to tell you why you came today. To fulfill your need for God in your life. To still the questions you have in your heart. How will God treat me after sin? How will he treat me after sin? This is the story of how God treats you after sin. This is how he treats you. It's not the way the world treats you, and it's not the way maybe many in the church will treat you. But it is the way God treats you. He treats you in grace and justice and mercy, kindness and love and compassion, even beyond what you could imagine. Don't miss this lesson today, for it was written for you, and to be preached to you. We had to be merry and rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live, was lost, 
and has been found. It's not hard to get lost. You can walk away from your house and get lost. Little kids do it all the time, don't they? You know what's interesting about being lost? Most people don't know they're lost. It's the people that have missed them that know they're lost. Think about the people in your life that you know are lost. They've lost their way. They've lost contact with God. This message for you. Let us pray. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people and for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. 1 Corinthians 2.14 to the third chapter, verse 3. What does that mean? It means you've separated yourself by choice from the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit to live the Christian life victorious. How do I get back into relationship with the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Godhood who indwells my body and has made the temple of God? You've got to examine your life because evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude type of sins. It could be sins of the tongue or overt sins. 1 John 1, 9 says, confess it. If we homologeo, if we name it, cite it, come into agreement with God, what is sin, as the Bible describes it, like in Romans 3.20. If I confess my sin, then here is the promise. God is faithful and just and righteous and will cleanse me from my sin and unrighteousness. I give you a moment to do that. For it is the Holy Spirit who wants to teach you the great truth today that makes sense to your life and puts, on you, puts upon you hearing the word of God to faith in God. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for these that have come our way today to study with us what it means to be spiritually lost and found and what it means to the person who is in that lost and found state, in that death living state and how we should rejoice in their restoration, in their recovery. I pray, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God on our souls today in Jesus' name. Amen. Many of you might be old enough to remember when they used to have lost and found departments in stores. Remember that? Now it's a service center. It's called service center. My wife used to work in such a store. My wife. And often she would go, they would need extra help in the lost and found department. She would go over there and work and she would come home with some of the most interesting stories about unusual things that get lost. And especially children. My youngest daughter, Angela, her, she has a son, Ben, who, who is a, a handful. He's now five. When he was four, she took him to a store with her to shop, to get some things, someplace like a Walmart. And they were looking at, you know, a time for toys, and for Ben, it's uh, garbage. He likes to go around and see who's got garbage and dump them. I know. Just telling you how sometimes four-year-olds go. And so they, she took him to the toy department and all that to kind of look around, because that, you know, she'd been in her departments for adults, and now she thought it was good to give him a... Uh, a time to be in the child's department. Let him have a moment of shopping and, and looking and 
calm down a little bit or get excited, however that works in a kid's life. Doesn't take much to get Ben excited. And uh, so they were talking, and he saw something he might like, and so he asked Mother if he could have it. And so a person came by uh, that worked in the store and wanted to know if they could help him. And so she turned to talk to them about it, and she turned back to talk to Ben, and he was gone. I mean, gone. I mean, just a split second. Uh, yeah, 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 Ben. And couldn't find him. They called and called and searched and searched. Could not find Ben. So they contacted the employee there, contacted the service center, and they put out an alert throughout the store looking for Ben. And they searched for Ben a pretty good while. Now you can imagine where the mama's heart's starting to go. Now everybody in the store is scouting. They've locked down it. I mean, we're in top security and everything. And after a pretty good time, Ben steps out and said, I'm the winner. And they said, the winner? You know, my, my daughter's thinking, I'm getting after you, buddy. He said, I'm the winner. And they said, a winner of what? And he said, hide and go seek. They had just been learning how to play hide and go seek. The winner. Can you imagine how, how well a four-year-old can hide himself that adults can't find him in a store? Hide and go seek. That's kind of the way our story is today. Lost and found department. That's a specialty for God. You know that? I'm so glad he specializes in that. I'm so thankful my own soul for it. I want to talk about four things today in the first hour that I think might be helpful to you in the spiritual lost and found. In the prodigal story or the parable of the prodigal son, being spiritually lost and found was taught by Jesus in this magnificent parable. It's a long parable. It's one of the longest in the Bible, if not the. It takes up a whole chapter, 32 verses. When you study it really well, you discover that this is broke up into three parts. It's one parable in three parts. When the writer, when the Holy Spirit of God gives you a parable and he gives you three parts, you look for the common theme. A parable only has one doctrinal point. You must learn that when you study parables. There may be a lot of things moving around in a parable, but there's only one point. One doctrinal point. So when you have a parable of moving parts, you, you've got the first part of the parable is a lost sheep. And the second part of the parable is a lost silver coin. And the, I put them in S words. And the third one is the son, the lost son, the prodigal son. So you've got moving parts to this. You don't have just a simple parable. You've got a parable that's moving in different parts. You've got a three-act play. There's three acts to this play, but it's one play with a theme. And so you always look for that. No matter how the moving parts are going in a, in a parable, you always look for the common theme. What is the point that God is trying to make? When you study this, you find that the common theme is in verse 7, verse 10, and verse 32. The spiritually lost and found. When he dealt with the sheep, you know there's one sheep that's lost and is found. And what did they do? They rejoiced. Who? The we. Not the he who found, but the we who are concerned with the loss. Are you with me? When you come to the ten coins you've got the same thing. You've got lost and found, and you've got a we. Who are the we? The, the, we's, the we's are the ones who were concerned with the lost, who are now celebrating with the find. When we get to the prodigal son, we have the same thing. So we, we know that the theme of this parable, even though it has moving parts, has three moving parts to it, we know that the point that God is making 
is about being spiritually lost and being spiritually found and how God treats it. You know, in 2 Peter 3, 9, God tells us that he is long-suffering and patient that what? None would perish, but all would come. All, none and all. None would perish, but all would come to salvation. All would come. Well, all would come to salvation. He called it repentance. All, none, that none would perish, but that all. When he sent his son to die on the cross and three days in the burial and up from the grave he arose, it was for that mission. He doesn't want any to be lost. He wants all to be found. He wants them all. He wants them all. And even though, even, even though he has 99 that are safe, he's concerned about the one that's lost. For the one back makes it the herd complete. You're not hearing me. Why do we, why do we carry the gospel message to the lost, to the unbeliever, to complete the flock? When you look around our church today and you see so many pews, you know what the answer is? We're missing our flock. I don't know what that means to you, but it should mean that there are sheep out there that need to be here. They're lost. They're lost. They're lost. And in the first story, they go out and they find the lost sheep. And they bring it back to make it a complete flock. When they lose the coin, they search for the coin. The coin is important, important to the group. The ten, they lost one. They need ten. They had 99. They would need one. They got to have 100. They lost the one. It's going like, look, well, you know, the law of averages, you know, you're always going to have spoil and deterioration. Uh, one, one sheep is always going, you're going to lose one sheep if the, in the pasture. The wolf is going to get one. I mean, it's not bad. Ah, yeah, it is for God. Listen, for God, none. It's, listen, the word is none and all. I don't know as the church, we have, we have grasped that. I'm not sure we have grasped the importance of why God sent his son in John 3.16 or in Romans 5.8 to save sinners. As Paul said, thank God, I look like I was safe. I was a religious person, but I was lost. Thank God that God don't let the religious person think that he's found, think that he's saved but brings a message of hope to a guy like me who was a very religious person, Paul said. But in 1 Timothy 1.15, he declares that he was a sinner and a chief sinner. He thanked God that God sent his son to rescue him, a very religious good person as far as his religion declared and yet needed. He was lost. He was lost. And how, how wonderful, he, listen to me, how wonderful his addition was to the flock. Would you agree with that? Well, if you love the Bible, you're going to have to fall in love with Paul because he wrote half of it. Aren't you glad that God wants to complete the flock with you today? The church needs you. The church. So in 1 Corinthians, here we are, 1545. Paul is in this great discussion of chapter 15 on the resurrection. And he stops and he says in verse 45, it is written. Now he's talking about the old canon. He's talking about the Old Testament, and he's talking about Genesis 2-7. And he says, so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. That's Genesis 2-7. 
And the last Adam, that's Jesus Christ, by the way, became a life-giving spirit. Now, here's what. Look up here. Okay. Look up. That wasn't that long a verse, was it? <laughs> look, look. When it says here, it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. You know what that, listen to me, that's really important. That's Salim Dumuth. So, sounds like something you'd order if you went to a restaurant. Salim Dumuth. I'll take a Salim Dumuth. You know what it is? It's a Hebrew idea, and it's phenomenal. Here's what it is. That God made man in his image according to his likeness. You ever heard that? Huh? Salim Dumuth. And that's, doesn't that, isn't that just smooth? Salim Dumuth. Who could not forget that? Well, you, you could, I suppose. But Salim Dumuth. What it means, it means made in the image according to the likeness of God. You know what separates in the creation story? What separates, and by the way, we'll start doing our, 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 um, our series out of Genesis soon, uh, coming attractions on the creation story. Marvelous thing. But Salim Dumud, made in the image according to the likeness of God, that's what separates the human, the human creation from the other days of order because in the Hebrew, everything else created goes under men in the Hebrew, M-I-N, and it's called species, not the human race. Makes it very clear when God created man in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, when he created man, he created man different than all the other categories of, of, of life, species life. He created it in the image according. He created it, Salim de Muth. He created the human soul after the pattern of divine essence. Think about that a little bit. I guess, I guess most educational, I guess most science classes are, are, are ready for that idea, aren't they? <laughs> Show you how far we've gotten. Show you how far away we've gotten from, away from the truth. You wouldn't even have a thing called science if it wasn't for God. There would be no such course as science without God. Science is the observation of what God's already created. And we take God out of it like man has, oh, listen, we just, you know, well, here's a piece of dirt. Get me a man. You girls would like that, wouldn't you? Here's what I want. Okay. There he is. Who could do that? God. <laughs> God. Took a clump of clay. I know you girls know it's dirt. And created a man. That's not the way he created you, though, girls. He did a design on you. But that's the way he created us, out of dirt. You girls know it. The first man, Adam, became a living soul. Look at the last Adam, became a life-giving spirit. You know who the last Adam is? Jesus Christ. Two federal heads. I put two circles down there. I put a first Adam and last Adam, right? In that first circle, I want you to write physical birth. Right? In that, the one on the left. <laughs> the first Adam, that's a little circle there. Write physical birth. You've already written somewhere in your paper. If not, Genesis 1, 26, 27. Salim Demuth, T-S-E-L-E-M-D-E-M-U-T-H. Uh, who wouldn't want to know Salim Demuth? You probably name your next kid that. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Over on the last Adam, you got spiritual birth. You know what's interesting about John 3? You know, in this great discussion with Nicodemus? 
you know, this thing goes on for 21 verses. We only quote, <laughs> we only quote one. We quote John 3.16. I'm just thrilled when you quote any verse. <laughs> it shows some personal interest in a verse, right? We only quote one verse out of that whole chapter. This is a dynamic chapter. And like I said, I'm happy with whatever you quote. It shows personal interest in something. But you know what's interesting? In the English, in verse 3 and verse 5, in that discussion with Nicodemus, the English said, you must be born again. That's not, that's not what the Scripture says. That's not what the Greek said. You know what the Greek said? You must be born from above. <laughs> now, there's a whole lot of difference there. Above what? Now, who thinks about birth from above? I mean, both of us think about birth from below. Have you not seen anything about birth? I've gone through four of them with my wife. Only one was I willing to look at and never again. <laughs> <laughs> that was enough for me. I thought, I could see how you might have one baby, but how would you ever have a second one? Not a man would do that. Not one. If we saw that, <laughs> no way, Jose. But we have that wonderful passage in John that says, it's not the pain of the birth that's rejo rejoicing to the woman. It's the delivery and the baby itself. When they put that baby on top of her tummy or where they put it, pain's all gone. Well, I, I say it's all gone, you know. I mean, apparently there's more joy in the baby than there is in the pain of it. But so you want to put spiritual birth over there, and you want to put John 3, 3, and 5 there where it says, you're not, not just, I, I'm okay with born again. I, I, I so. Born from above, though, not from below. That means that's spiritual. It's a divine birth. Born from, born from God. Born from God. From the plan of God. Born from above, not below. See, most birth is from below. This one's from above. God. Born from God. I know. I got to keep working with you until you get it. Here's physical birth. That's from below. Here's spiritual birth. That's from above. It's not human. It's not through a human system of procreation birth. You understand that? It's not of the natural realm. It's of the spiritual realm. It's not of the natural realm. It's the spiritual realm. The natural realm comes from the first Adam. The spiritual realm comes from the second Adam who dies on a cross, is buried and raised from the dead, called the gospel. When you believe that, you're saved. For the gospel, Romans 1.16, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes it. Believes that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. That's called the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. And then you have this wonderful thing in Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself, gift of God, not of works, at least you boast. All the boast goes to God. Have you had that experience? If you've not had that experience, you've not been born from above. The Romans 1.16 says the gospel. He dies for your sins, buried and raised from the dead. The gospel is the power of God to save those who believe. That's being born from above. And the new birth is born from above. Here's one you ought to write on your paper, John 7, 38 and 39. John 7, 38 and 39. You ought to write this on your paper. He who believes in me, Christ said, as the scriptures have said, Old Testament, from the innermost being, from one's innermost being, you know, kind of like where you burp from. shall flow rivers of living 
divine water. Then he says, this he spoke of the Holy Spirit, whom those who would believe in him were to receive after he has been glorified. After he dies, buried, raised, 40 days of post-resurrection appearances, and ascends back to the Father, Acts 1.11, ascends back to the Father to be seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. Then the Holy Spirit will come. We have just done a marvelous series on Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. Do you understand these two federal heads of the human race? You're in one of them. <laughs> and if you're in Christ, you, were, you started out in that one, and you got saved, and now you're in that one. Do you know that? How come you don't know that? Very clearly taught. You do now, though, don't you? You got a Bible verse for it, too. Somebody asks you, how do you know that? You can turn to 1 Corinthians 15, 45 and tell them. You don't have to guess anymore. We learn how members of the human race are lost and dead in Adam. In Romans 5, 12, wherefore is by one man Adam sin into the world and death by sin. Watch this now. And so death, spiritual death, was passed on or spread to the rest of humanity. For all have sinned in that. Do you know what passed on means in theology? The word spread or passed on? That's a key word in Romans 5.12. You know what? In theology, we call it the imputation of Adam's sin. In theology. And that's why I get paid these big bucks. I can use terms like that. Imputation of Adam's sin. That's what we were talking about in Romans 5.12. You ought to read the whole thing through 21. Don't read just one verse. You ought to read the whole thing. And, and, and you know why Romans 5.12 is important? Because it, it started out in Genesis 2.17. Don't eat of the tree! <laughs> no, you, what, what, don't eat of the tree in the middle of the garden. Don't do that. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. For in the day you eat dying, you will die. It's a doubling up of the word muth from a cal infinitive to a cal imperfect. That means absolutely. English don't know how to do that, so they say surely. <laughs> you will surely die, or absolutely, <laughs> boom, dead. And he, and he used the word Hebrew word muth twice. Muth, muth. In other words, there's going to be two deaths. There's going to be a physical death and a spiritual death. Or in order, there's going to be a spiritual death and there's going to be a physical death. Adam lived 900, 950 days after he sinned and he died. He had a spiritual death and then he had a physical death. You know that. You've studied the Bible. The imputation of Adam's sin covered in this word spread to all man or passed on to all mankind in Romans 5.12. The imputation of Adam's sin carries 13 judicial charges. It has nothing to do with your behavior. It has to do with your physical birth. Everybody's born in Adam dead, spiritually dead because of Adam's sin. Imputation of Adam's sin. You say, I never heard that. I know. <laughs> I hear it all the time. Come here, you hear it. It's, it's the story of Romans 5, 12 through 21. It's the story of Romans 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It's five chapters. He's been pounding this subject. I just picked it up at the end of this. He's chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5. I'm at the end of that. I, get, I just gave you the end of this great series of study on the imputation of Adam's sin and why salvation is so necessary, why all men are born lost and dead and need to be found and brought to life in Christ. 
13 judicial charges. Pick up this little pamphlet called 50 Things You Receive at Salvation You Never Lose in Time and Eternity. They're free. Just pick it up on your way out. <laughs> your, it has nothing to do with your behavior. It has to do with your position at Adam. Alienated from God. Blind. Cursed and condemned. Spiritually blind. Spiritually dead. At enmity with God. You're the natural person. You're perishing. You're a sinner. All of this was because of Adam. You're unrighteous. You're unholy. You're ungodly. You're under the wrath of God. Thirteen judicial charges, all because you're an Adam. That's the word spread to all mankind. That's the word passed on to all mankind. That's the imputation in theology. That's the imputation. This is the Christian message. This is the message that the world needs to hear from the church. That's why you need to be saved. You cannot, that's called the slave market of Adam's sin, and you can't get out of it except through Jesus Christ. God sent his son into the world to rescue and to transfer you, to rescue from Adam and to transfer you into Christ. All right, all right, look, I prove what I say. Let's go to Colossians. Look, I just show you. I'm going to have to bring your Bible and study with me, though, aren't you? Huh? You go, come here, you got to bring a Bible. Or, or if not, we'll f afford you one. If you don't have a Bible today, there's one in the view, take it home. We'd be glad to give you a Bible. Here's Colossians 1.13. Watch this now. I'm over here in Adam. On your paper, I'm on the next page, and I'm about through. <laughs> go, go to point three. Go to point three, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. I'm going to go back to Colossians. But on the top of your paper, I'm at point three, and I'm going to quit. But 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says, in Adam, all what? See your two circles? Are you, are, have you had two circles you haven't written in yet? <laughs> I learned this from Chuck Farmer. Visualize. Visualize. Make your congregation have eye contact, mind contact, eye contact, and hand contact. In the circle called Adam, you ought to write all die. In that circle, write all die. If you're an Adam, you're dead. You're lost and dead. And every person dies. This is how you start the, the life. The physical life begins in Adam. You've got to be born from where? Above. Not born from below. You've got to be born from above. You've got to be born of God, not of man. I'm trying to make this simple. I know how. In Adam all die, so also in Christ what? Here's the other circle, Christ. Jesus Christ over here. Here's Christ. All are what? Now, write in this circle, because you miss it if you don't write it. You'll miss it. Your brain will go like, I, what did he say? Write it down, and your brain will get it. See, you've got to teach yourself. You do know that, don't you? It's called memory. <laughs> you do know you have memory. That's because you rehearse. Your memory has to have memory. And so you repeat things to yourself till you get it, right? You want to learn a verse, you have, to, you have to read it several times to yourself. And then you go like, I got it. Stop it. I got it. You don't have to do that again. So what you have in the Christ circle, here in Adam, all die. In Christ, all are made alive. All are made alive. All are made alive. Born from above. All are made. You know what life that is? That's eternal life. That's divine life. That's, that's divine life. And I put verses beneath them. Now, I want you to go to Colossians 1.13. We're going to close. Colossians 1. You can read the rest of it. Colossians 1.13. For he delivered. Now, did, did, I, did I put the cross there? I put the cross. He dies on the cross. He's buried. See that line going down? He's buried. And then up from the grave he arose. You got that? That's my symbol I use. You, you see it on your paper. I wrote it, didn't I? Okay. I, I, sometimes I don't. 
Now watch. Do I have a couple little things coming out of the cross like over to the two circles? Do I have those things? Thank you. I really baby feed you. <laughs> and that's okay. That's okay. Now here's Colossians. Now I'm going to, here's Colossians 1.13. I wrote it on your paper. Now your Bible may, may use the word deliver. He delivered or rescued. So the arrow that goes from the cross to Adam, write the word rescued. And see the, air, see the line that goes from the cross over to Jesus? See that little loop? Yeah, look, look up here. See the loop I made? Okay. <laughs> We're all getting loopy, aren't we? Right now. That loop I made over there? Right? Write the word transferred. Write the word transferred. Hey, look at You got to do that because you teach yourself. All I'm doing, I'm just helping you. In Colossians 1.13, listen to what Colossians 1.13. He, Jesus Christ, rescues us from the domain of darkness, that's Adam, 1.13 judicial charges against you in Adam, against Adam, is darkness. He rescued us from the domain of darkness, watch this now, and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. Look, one... The, listen, you're, you're missing it. Look, look. teach yourself. Right? I know you can teach one half of you. You've got to teach the second half of you. I can put it in your head. Then your head has to teach yourself. Please tell me you know that. If you've gone, any, if you've gone to school 12 years at least, then you know this. This is the way it works. I mean, I'm not, this is nothing magical here. It's just how you teach yourself. Now, watch this. It, these two things... See that? From the cross, whoo, over. See those two things? They occur at the same time. Boom! There it is. The moment you believe that Jesus died for your sins were buried and raised from the dead the third day, boom! He rescues you from the, domain, dom, d, d, from the domain of darkness and transfers you into the kingdom of the beloved Son. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself as a gift of God. Whoa. You get that? Eh, there's more on that page you can read. Apparently, that's home study because <laughs> I've run out of time. I've run out of time today. What a wonderful, what a wonderful class you have been today for me. Wonderful. I can't thank you enough to walk in with positive volition. I can see it in your eyes and allow me the privilege to teach you something from the Word of God to stir your soul, to just stir your soul. about the spiritually lost and found. We need to be the people who rejoice when, when people are saved. We need to be that people that are part of searching for the lost sheep and the lost coin and then being able to celebrate with those who come into the kingdom of God. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for these who have come and visited with us, Father, by the automobile and by the Internet. I pray today the Holy Spirit would minister truth to all of their souls. Take this message to the highways and byways and all the people that travel them. Take this message, take this message to the world, for it is the message of hope, eternally hope, confident expectation of what God says he will do, Romans 4.21. We're so thankful for it in Jesus' name. Amen.